Um, it's a real honor to be here today at what promises to be a, a really challenging and enlightening discussion about what constitutes the future for innovation in our industry. And yeah, this couldn't be happening at a, at a better time uh, for us as an industry. This is the most dynamic period in healthcare in at least a generation for the US and indeed for the entire world. Here in the US, as you all know, uh, we're getting ready to implement probably the largest change to our healthcare system uh, since the introduction of employer-based insurance during the Second World War. Um, in just a few months, tens of millions of individuals across the United States will be expected to be insured through healthcare exchanges and in some states through an expansion of the Medicaid program. This is part of a much larger debate in the US and indeed around the world, but the US debate is the one that will define the future of healthcare in this, the largest, the most innovative market in the globe. And the issues we face here though are in no ways unique to the US. You know, governments, society, we as individuals, companies face the same questions independent of geography. How do we know what works and pay only for that? What choices is it reasonable to give a terminal cancer patient for whom every opportunity, every new therapy, however expensive, however risky, however dangerous, represents a lifeline to hope? What type of care is it reasonable for us as a society to give to those who live below the poverty line? And indeed, on a global basis, what type of care should we expect for those who live below a dollar a day? If we fail to confront these questions, we will bankrupt our nation and every nation. If we do confront them, we're forced to face basic and fairly fundamental issues about what type of society we live in, what our obligations are to each other, and what our obligations are to generations to come. And at the heart of these questions is basic discussion about the nature of innovation, the nature of value, and what progress really means in our, in the, in our industry. So I know we all continually assess the changes that are happening in healthcare around the world. How patients and providers and, and payers are consuming information. How market drivers have shifted and continue to change the pattern of healthcare. And now more than ever, it's key that we understand the changing way in which healthcare is delivered and bring forward holistic, innovative, valued solutions. I'll use that word a lot, valued solutions that help payers, providers, and patients. Now, we in the pharmaceutical industry are really encouraged, actually, to see that a time when healthcare systems are really focused on cost, they're really focused on value, that they still perceive medicine to be a good investment. Indeed, in 2012, the Congressional Budget Office acknowledged the value of medicines in their contribution to the overall healthcare ecosystem. And announced it would change how it scores prescription drug legislation to recognize the offsetting effects of drug use on medical services. By adjusting their me methodology, they've shown that they clearly recognize the role that pharmaceuticals can play. At a time when every dollar is scrutinized, it's key that innovation will be rewarded. But it's key that it will only be rewarded if it represents genuine value. Meanwhile, the research-based pharmaceutical industry or biopharmaceutical industry is really challenged and has been for a decade. Our successes have been many, but there continue to be significant medical needs for which we have no answer and for which innovative medicines are an imperative. And there's a sense that the low-hanging fruit, if it were ever there, and many of you will uh, doubt that, having worked in the industry for such a long time. If it was there, it's well and truly gone. We are victims to some extent of our own success. And the bar for new medicines is driven ever higher by the genericization of our past victories. Over the next decade, 120 medicines will lose patent protection. 
78% of prescriptions in the US are now for generic drugs. And that is not a bad thing. But it's worth considering that the gold standard formulary, the peak of innovation, the bleeding edge of the pharmaceutical industry in 2002 will be the baseline generic formulary by 2020. So I'm not going to claim that I know in detail what innovation is going to look like in the future. My psychic powers are a little more limited than that. However, I don't think you actually need a crystal ball to tell what are the things that are going to define that, what's going to shape uh, innovation in the years to come. No matter what the future holds, we are fundamentally shifting to a model that demands greater value through higher quality care and better health outcomes and lower cost. This is not an or game, this is an and game. So the question for all of us in this room and for me, for the pharmaceutical industry in particular, is where do we fit in this new universe? And perhaps more importantly, what is your role and my role in supporting positive change that ensures continued investment in the innovation that drives our industry and drives ultimately outcomes for patients? So GSK, we are placing absolutely unrelenting focus on delivering value. In our products, in our customer-centric commercial model, and most importantly of all, in our behavior and the way that we live our values. Today, I'd like to address each of these three things, one by one. So let's start with products. I hope you will agree, although maybe we could have a poll during the Q&A afterwards that the biopharmaceutical industry has made some of the most important contributions of any industry to improving the well-being of the world's population. And we continue to deliver progress for patients who depend on our medicines to, in the words of GSK's mission, do more, feel better, and live longer. In fact, 400 new medicines have been approved between 2000 and 2012, with 43 last year alone. However, and I want to be careful not to sound too negative about a business and an industry that I love. I think many of us will agree that the late 90s and the early aughts were not perhaps the most innovative years in our illustrious industry's history. We saw some fantastic scientific advances, of course, but there were an awful lot of products with XL or XR after their name. The concept of me too, or you know, maybe more nicely put, me better, but really meaning me too, became part of the strategic lexicon of the pharma industry. Specialty pharma with formulation as the key source of innovation and an arms race in the sales and marketing organizations ensued. We got into a pattern, we got into a rut, we became addicted to products that were not dramatically different than what preceded them. We also saw an industrialization of drug discovery and development, and I don't think that the combination of the products with XL and XR after their name and the focus in our R&D organizations on incremental versus revolutionary change, I don't believe that link is a coincidence. In a quest for blockbusters and with the mentality that bigger is better, more is better, we lost sight of the individual and the personal contribution that scientists make to breakthroughs. And we also lost sight of the circumstances, the need to create within our labs the opportunity for serendipity. Now, GSK, the entire industry, in fact, has realized for a number of years that this has been an issue. And we need to get back to rediscovering that sense of inspiration. And we've seen again, a transformation in the R&D organizations around the world. Gone are the sort of monolithic days of industrialized R&D. Within every large company, we're seeing smaller, more nimble operations, more collaborations with partners from every corner of the scientific community. And very importantly, a real rigor as to the process that tells us which assets to progress, which assets are going to become potential medicines, and which are not. And as a result, I'm actually incredibly optimistic about the future of drug discovery, not just within GSK, but as an industry. Ahead of us is a massive opportunity to tackle the next generation of medical challenges, to solve the problems that we as citizens expect of, we in the, of us in the healthcare industry. 
Heart attacks, cancer, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, autoimmune diseases, rare genetic disorders, and more broadly around the world, malaria, drug-resistant tuberculosis, even in this day and age, disgraceful diarrhea. We have the opportunity to take on increasingly complex research, yield new types of treatment, completely new forms of treatment, and harness the promise of the major scientific advances, and they have been enormous, that have happened in the last 20 years. And in many cases, the medicines that we produce will be more tailored to patients, resulting in faster and cheaper development, a better outcome for the patients for whom the medicine is appropriate, and reducing waste and therefore cost in the healthcare system, in all adding value. So I'm very, very optimistic about the future of our R&D-based pharma industry. But I feel it does a great disservice to our field, and particularly to the scientists and clinicians who work within GSK and every other large pharma company, when people say we sell pills. Yeah, we, we do do that, just in case you're wondering. We sell pills, but my view, that is simply, that simply delivering a chemical in a convenient package completely misses the point of what producing a medicine in the modern era means. Because what we bring to the table isn't really chemistry. What differentiates and adds value isn't chemistry, but information. What differentiates a medicine from the bulk chemistry is not the pills, it's not even the R&D investment, it's not the patents, it's the information that tells you whether and how this incredibly potent and potentially dangerous chemical will affect a disease state, will help an individual patient. And it's our responsibility now to bring forward an increasingly complex and complete picture and a package of information to answer the questions that an increasingly complex customer is asking. What do providers, payers, and patients need to make healthcare decisions? Making a valuable contribution to improving health and to improving the healthcare system starts with realizing that although previously all that was needed was safety and efficacy. Today, we have to deliver value to the customers who are expecting to pay for it. And that may be sort of well known in the audience, but I think as a drug discoverer, you have to constantly remind yourself of that. Interesting science is completely insufficient unless it adds value to the people who are going to be paying for it. Without this, reimbursement is poor, and patients will have a very difficult time accessing it. Different countries have different approaches to restricting patient access to things that don't add value, but they're all getting a lot better at it, including the US. Let me be clear, safety and efficacy are critical, and we will always meet our obligations to the regulatory authorities. However, customers and patients are expecting more. We have fantastic marketing and customer engagement capabilities. But if the value of the product isn't clear for patients and for providers, no matter of share of voice will cause it to sell. Those days are far gone. So at GSK and pharma companies everywhere, the need for truly cross-functional approach has been realized, whereby uh, medical development and commercial teams coordinate very early to define the value proposition to all of the customer groups that we're dealing with. Our team includes R&D, it includes our customer business insight, it includes health outcomes, it includes our global commercial brand leads, and we call this our medicine vision. And we challenge ourselves to answer objectively, realistically, without any ownership or perception that this is our baby. What is the value, compelling value proposition for this, for this medicine? From a payer perspective, from a provider perspective, and from a patient perspective. So we hold multiple workshops during the development process to, include, to ensure we have a really well-designed plan to deliver that vision. And if we don't, then we don't carry on development. Now, obviously, our commercial staff don't participate in the design or the conduct or the publication of research, but we do provide insight into what factors will differentiate that medicine and what constitutes value in the eyes of the paying customer. And I'm pleased to say since implementing this, the, the majority of our pipeline, and we implemented about three years ago, the majority of our pipeline now comes with uh, a profile that will meet payer hurdles. And this is useful because 
you, to be honest, I think there was a lot of discussion in the pharmaceutical industry, if you go back a few years, as to whether the payer hurdles were ever meet, were able to be met, whether actually the future of innovation was a lot gloomier than I've portrayed it in the first half of this discussion. But the reality is we are able to meet those hurdles. It just requires a different, more integrated and more thoughtful approach to how we develop our potential medicines. Now we also know, and this is not going to be rocket science, that a lot of the best ideas are not going to come from inside GSK. And whereas in the past, I think pharmaceutical companies felt a sense of desperation. The pipeline was bare, the cupboard was bare, and therefore we had to go outside. Nowadays, I think it's a much more strategic view that the opportunities around the world of the research that does not exist within our walls is so far in excess of that research that does exist within our walls that we would be missing an opportunity for ourselves, but also missing an opportunity for patients and for healthcare in general if we are not capable of going out and sourcing that. So now, and it has been for a while, and it will continue to be, pharma companies are defined not so much, not just by what they can do internally, but also their ability to source innovation globally. Certainly within the walls of GSK, whether it's sort of down the road in Philadelphia or Upper Merion, or in our base in RTP or in London, we have recognized that we do not have the monopoly on new ideas and we have been actively seeking for the past decade collaborations and we have been very successful at it and I'm confident that the symbiotic relationship between pharma and biotech and academic basic research will continue. However, what's interesting at the moment is actually the new types of collaboration that are emerging between industry, academia, and the government as well. In fact, I'm very proud to work for a company that has as a key opportunity and is committed to being a partner to governments around the world in their national public health efforts. And this isn't limited to the developing world, although you can easily see how that would be the case. It's also true here in the US. We're engaged in public-private collaborations to protect against pandemics, bioterrorism threats, and infectious diseases. On the vaccines front, for example, GSK is collaborating with BARDA within the US Department of Health and Human Services and with Texas A&M University Systems uh, to establish an influenza vaccines manufacturing capability to enable a rapid response in the event of a pandemic and it's not just the establishment of that capability in Texas. It's also the linking of that to the rest of our vaccines manufacturing network, including our facilities in Marietta, who will do packing and filling in the event of a pandemic, that shows the value of that collaboration between academia, pharma, and government. These type of public health collaborations between the government, academia, and, and the private sector are helping improve the US preparedness for pandemic. And the promise of new innovative solutions like that is actually bringing groups together like never before. At GSK, we view these as one part of our mission to help people do more, feel better, and live longer. But we're also learning from outside our in in industry like never before. I think actually one of the most interesting shifts of attitude within the pharma industry is the willingness to understand that we can't, if we want to be the best, we can't just compare ourselves to others in the pharma industry. We have to look outside and learn from the best at each particular competency that we wish to master. And GSK's partnership with the McLaren Group, uh, hands up who knows what the McLaren Group is. Excellent. Lots of Indi Indian NASCAR fans. Okay, this is Formula One. Uh, Formula One motor racing, the premier motor racing, in case anybody was, was wondering whether it was Indy or something. Um, and the McLaren Group is the most successful racing team. And they have a fantastic capability in engineering, high-tech innovation, in analytics, and in data modeling. And that capability has been honed in probably one of the most evolutionarily pressurized environments on the front line of a grid. And they've been very successful. They've been on the podium one, two, or three, 50% of the time of the races they've competed in over the last 20 years. And so GSK has got a strategic partnership with McLaren that enables us to learn firsthand their capabilities and then apply them to 
our core business areas. So the question is, well, why the hell did you do that, GSK? What, what on earth has McLaren got to teach you? And it might seem like a curious match, what do pharma and uh, motor racing have in common, um, apart from they're both inherently sexy businesses. However, I think it's easy to ignore experience because it doesn't come from within our walls or within our industry or within our paradigm. And actually, GSK and McLaren have an awful lot in common. These are two great companies, leaders in their field, excellent, very successful. And they're both focused on high-tech research, on science and on innovation. But McLaren has this unique data-rich approach combined with an incredible focus on high-performing teams that enables them to deliver 16 weeks a year in a Formula One environment. And it enables us, it helps us in their, through their partnership to become more agile and more efficient. And in this field, farmers becoming increasingly efficient, increasingly pressurized. In this field, quality, consistency of implementation, agility, efficiency, and speed will set us apart from our competition. And the end result of that is that we should be able to deliver more to patients for less. We will be more efficient at the delivery of our pharmaceuticals to the end user. All that said, the focus on delivering value can't just be one that applies only to R&D. For the pharma industry, in fact, I think for the entire healthcare industry to succeed, we cannot force fit our old business models into a new healthcare environment. Our commercial organizations need to focus on what customers are looking for and what patients need. And at GSK, we have fundamentally changed the way we sell our medicines and vaccines. This began with a new structure, as most things do in pharma. You align your resources, not around our brands and areas of therapy, as is traditional, but around our customers, the different types of customers that we serve. This isn't an all-or-nothing approach. We haven't moved everybody off brands, but it represents the transitional state that we are in as, a, as an environment, as the healthcare system. For instance, we created a new unit that's focused on understanding the needs of various customer segments, so be it corporate-owned independent practices, independent medical practices, integrated delivery networks and hospitals. And each of those teams has developed strategies that span our portfolio for how we engage with those customers. And we've consolidated the teams, we've reduced them and we've narrowed them and focused them on the types of customer and the value that they provide. This is increasingly important because more than half of the physicians in the US now are aligned with or employed by integrated delivery systems or hospitals. But perhaps most dramatic for us and for our industry has been the changed approach to how we reimburse and reward our sales representatives, something that truly sets us apart from our peers. In 2011, I'm proud to say we became the first pharma company to decouple the pay of our sales reps from the number of prescriptions issued. So those of you who have been in a sales and marketing organization will know what a big deal that is. We've yet to be followed by anybody else in the industry, but we look forward to them joining us. Under the new program, sales reps continue to be compensated with salary and bonus. But the bonuses are no longer based on individual sales targets. And instead of measuring performance against uh, prescriptions issued, we're measuring performance against selling competencies. How good are you at actually doing your job? We're measuring performance against customer feedback from physicians. And we're measuring performance against the performance of the entire business unit that the sales rep happens to work for. In doing so, we are obviously, consciously, and very visibly aligning our performance measures and our rewards with our values. And doctors, who we call on all the time, can be absolutely confident that our sales professionals are genuinely focused on improving patients' health. We call this program Patient First, and when you talk to our field teams, they will tell you it has completely changed how they engage with physicians 
and the level of trust that physicians have in them, knowing their objective is not just to get them to write another script, but genuinely to provide valuable information and education that enables a physician to make the right choices. As many in this room can attest, working in the pharma industry is incredibly rewarding. But it's not without its challenges. It is a fact that many people come to work for our business because they want to change people's lives. And yet, at times, due to lack of leadership and poor decision making, an industry that saves lives can be the focus of so much anger and frustration by society. In my opinion, this is a reflection of how we've failed to meet our society's expectations. It's time to realize that society expects, in fact, society deserves more from us. We must be committed to the highest ethical standards, conducting our business with integrity and with a focus on patients. This isn't optional. This is not a bolt-on. This is an integral thread woven into the fiber of our industry. We must be committed to doing what is right for patients, conducting robust, groundbreaking, scientific research, manufacturing quality products, ethically marketing and selling our medicines and vaccines. Running our business in a responsible way is fundamental to our success and inseparable from our strategic priorities. They are the same thing. Demonstrating our integrity like this is the key that opens the door to collaboration within our industry. And ultimately, it's what enables us to demonstrate the value of our industry in providing healthcare solutions for patients, providers, and for payers. We see fantastic opportunities to move, to collaborate across the industry, to move policy forward as well. Together with stakeholders across healthcare, in total, we can identify and implement best practice in prevention and care delivery. We can pursue new approaches to maximize patient adherence and self-management, and we can promote the adoption of fully integrated electronic health records. And we're seeing payers and provider groups respond to this, and they're also focused on collaboration amongst themselves with new models being explored to coordinate medical care. Sustainability of our system in the long term is going to require more change significant changes to the delivery of care and to the payment for healthcare. But we all actually have an opportunity to be engaged in how we can improve outcomes through that coordinated, integrated healthcare system. Now, I've focused a lot on where we've been and where I think we're going. I've focused on the nature of innovation. I've focused on our industry's reputation. And I think we're heading towards a newer, more nimble, research-focused industry where collaboration with all types of partners will be key. And dramatic changes like the one that GSK has made to its incentive compensation have transformed the dialogue with customers, all customers. This is an exciting and dynamic time for the healthcare sector. The pharma industry is genuinely focused on delivering real value to payers, providers, and patients. I believe our best days lie ahead in solutions to those diseases that we have yet to conquer. And I believe their solutions we'll find together. Thank you.